Bueno, buenas tardes. Vamos a comenzar con la charla de Stephen Minter. Eh, ya sabéis todo, ¿no?, cómo va a funcionar. Ya hemos hablado antes, todos tenéis claro qué vamos a hacer, ¿vale? Eh, no obstante, os lo introduzco a él, ¿vale?, para que sepáis quién es. Stefan Minter eh, es profesor de la, de, de la Universidad de Freiburg. Estudió eh, empresariales, cuando entonces había empresariales, ahora son eh, ciencias económicas. Eh, se doctoró en finanzas eh, y ha hecho, está dando clases desde 2012, que, que se doctoró y, y es funcionario ya en la universidad. Está dando clases de matemática financiera, eh, de microeconomía, finanzas públicas en Freiburg. Tiene bastantes artículos eh, escritos relacionados con la Unión Europea, los costes de las fronteras exteriores de la Unión Europea, eh, inmigración en la Unión Europea, relacionado con derechos y deberes de la Unión Europea. Entonces, es bastante interesante la posibilidad que tenemos hoy de escucharlo aquí y de escucharlo en inglés. And now we will speak English with uh, Stefan. Stefan, now you have the floor. Please, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, welcome everybody. So, I guess, first of all, I have to start by giving an apology, right? Because my Spanish is not very good, so I'm afraid that I have to talk to you in English today. Um, but I promise that next time I'm here in Cadiz, I'm trying to do it in Spanish. And then since I'm here uh, for the beginning of the week and you have such a nice place here, and I definitely would like to come back to visit Cadiz, uh, Cadiz once again and then maybe do again the presentation. Um, yes, as Louis already uh, told you, I am um, from Freiburg in Germany, and uh, in Freiburg I am the Erasmus Departmental Coordinator in Economics. But besides coordinating the Erasmus program, I'm also a teacher at the university. And as a teacher at the university, I'm teaching a course which is called European Union Economics. So the economics concerning questions um, around just European Union and Europe in itself. And when I planned my visit here to Cadiz, I was thinking about the topic that I could talk about today. And I was thinking about maybe migration might be interesting to you. But then, of course, uh, the Eurozone crisis came to my mind, because I guess you all know that Spain is very much affected by the Eurozone crisis. And for me, coming from Germany, you see large differences between these two countries in the Eurozone crisis. Yeah? You have very high unemployment rates at the moment in Spain. 25%, yeah, almost 50% among the young people. And in Germany, it's the exact opposite. So if I'm talking to my students in Germany, it's, it's sometimes hard to explain that we're having indeed an economic crisis. Because in Germany, we have historically low unemployment rates at the moment. We have almost full employment. And that's a stark contrast to what you are seeing here in Spain. And one of the purposes of my presentation is today to explain this a bit. Yeah? So why, does it, why is there such a large difference between Germany and Spain at the moment? And what caused the crisis, which is happening at the moment, still happening at the moment? And how can policy react to this crisis? Yeah? So actually, the plan for today, what we're going to do, to, to do today. First, I would like to present you some stylized facts on the Eurozone crisis. So there we are taking a quick look at economic performance, just to demonstrate how this crisis unfolded, what happened here, and how is the recovery going on? Yeah, I guess you know that the economic crisis began somewhere in 2008, 2009, which is almost seven years ago. So we are seven years now in an economic crisis. What about recovery here? Yeah, we would expect to see some recovery um, over this time span. So this is part one of the presentation, and then I'm going to continue to part two and part three. And there you see, I'm already coming to policy failures here. Yeah, and policy failures, so there seems to be something wrong with policy. Yeah, because you're seeing this economic crisis, and normally we would, our politicians, expect to react to this crisis and to alleviate the consequences of the crisis. So what can politicians do that, for instance, employment levels are again raising in Spain. Yeah? You see, part two, we are talking about the so-called Eurozone as an optimum currency area. This is actually a question um, which concerns the ex-ante situation. So before the crisis happened, 
Yeah? So something was designed in Europe. The currency union was designed and institutions have been created quite a long time ago. But there might be the possibility that these institutions have been created with a mistake in it, with a failure in it. Yeah? And therefore we're taking a look uh, at policy failure number one before the crisis actually occurred. Part three of the presentation is then policy failure number two, question mark, and this might be policy failure after the crisis occurred. So the reaction to the crisis then from the policy. Yeah? It's the title here, fiscal policy at the lower interest bound. Sounds awful, yeah? but this means we're seeing the lower interest rate bound because we are hitting interest rates which are at a level of actually zero percent. Yeah? So if you are following um, press coverage yesterday, the ECB again lowered interest rates now to definitely zero per percent. Yeah? And this is a very unusual situation for interest rates here. Yeah? At the lower interest rate bound. So this is then actually the question policy failure number two after the crisis occurred, reaction to the, um, to the crisis. Then. Okay, be before we start, before we start today, quick cartoon here. Yeah, you see in this picture here, two people sitting on a bench and in front of the building of the European Commission here. And the older guy here says, for 50 years, Europe has meant peace. And that's always important to remember. We are talking about economics here, about economic growth in the following, about unemployment. But you always have to see that one of the main achievements of the European Union is that we are seeing peace for such a long time in Europe. And in former times, this was not the case. Yeah? We had a lot of wars going on in Europe between Germany and France, between Spain and England, for instance. And now we're seeing almost 60 years in Europe of no wars, yeah? of peace. And this is an achievement of the European Union. So if we're talking about economics, we always have to see that there is another side. Yeah? There's something else besides economics. And of course, the, the, the most important foundation for sound economic, uh, for sound economic environment, for good economic environment, is peace. Uh, you cannot have good economic performance and well-being without peace. So that's really important. So, but then, to the economic side here. So first, some stylized facts on the eurozone crisis. We are taking a look at some data actually here. Yeah, so you're seeing here data, and I picked some countries here. Yeah, I picked Germany as an example of a northern country, and I picked two southern countries here, which are Spain and Italy. And then additionally, the dotted line here is the euro area compromising all 18 countries, which is something like an average, yeah, the average performance in, in Europe. So you're seeing here the beginning of the crisis, somewhere 2008 and 2009, yeah, and GDP growth. Yeah, so the growth from year to year in economic performance was in negative, yeah? so we're actually seeing a recession there. Yeah? This was a big financial crisis beginning in the United States, coming to Europe. You see real estate price bubble burst in, in Spain, also in the United States, and this all meant economic crisis. Then we saw a rather quick recovery. Yeah? You see this moving up again, 2010, 2011 recovery, at least concerning Germany. Yeah? You see some recovery also in Spain and in Italy, but then afterwards, it again crashed down. Yeah, it's called the so-called double dip here. Yeah, and since then, we are seeing growth levels around 0% or even negative. Yeah, so we can argue the crisis still holds. Yeah, we are not through the crisis now. Although, if you're taking a look at the curve for Spain, the red one, for the last two years, you're seeing that growth rates are rising again. And for instance, the International Monetary Fund, yeah, one big institution, is arguing that Spain is actually seeing rebounding growth. Yeah, you see this also in the headline here. Rebounding growth for Spain, so Spain is on its way to improvement. Yeah, but we always have to consider, these are growth rates. And you see growth rates now in the positive, but growth rates just give you the change from year to year. Uh, and if we're taking a different look here at absolute levels, yeah, we're seeing that economic performance in Spain is still below the situation that was for the crisis. 
Yeah, you're, you're seeing here GDP per capita, which is actually income per capita. Yeah, and income per capita here is below the levels that we saw in 2007. So from this point of view, we can argue uh, things might be improving over the last two years, but we're still, we have still a long way to go to re recovery yeah, and to making up the losses that we have seen during the crisis. So limited recovery here in Spain and especially in the southern European countries. You see, this is completely different to Germany. Yeah, Germany is on a positive way here, and you see even that the, um, the, the absolute levels have been achieved rather quickly after the crisis, and since then we're seeing positive growth. Yeah? So large difference also between northern states like Germany, Austria, Netherlands, and the southern states like Italy and Spain and so on, large difference. So it's even more striking to see the consequences of the crisis if we are taking a look at the GDP, at the expected path of GDP. So the expected path of the development of economic performance. You see, we're beginning here with a presentation somewhere in 2006 and 2007. Again, you see Germany yellow, Spain in red. And then the projection from the side of the European Commission was that countries in the European Union should be on a good way for further growth. No, on a good way. This was before the crisis. Then the crisis happened, of course, 2007, 2008, and we are crashing down. And you see how far Spain, the economic performance in Spain is lagging behind the expected growth path before the crisis. Yeah? So you see, these are really the consequences of the economic crisis, and especially for Spain, which seemed to have been on a good path before the economic crisis hit in 2007. Yeah? So we are still way below the expected levels of economic performance. Yeah? And this is not also for Spain, but also for Germany. Yeah? But this is natural in an economic crisis, but, but especially pronounced for Spain. Okay, even more striking. We can compare the current crisis to the, you might call them, the mother of all crises. And the mother of all crises was the Great Recession. The Great Recession in the 20s and in the 30s, yeah, prior to World War II, to the Second World War. Now I've picked here industrial production representing this in these two depressions. Yeah, so the, the blue line is the depression from the 20s, from the 30s, and the red line is the current depression here. And you see, the depression from the, the Great Depression in the 20s, it was more severe at the beginning. You see industrial production dropping to 70%. But then recovery was rather quick, and it followed on. Yeah, beginning from, three, uh, from, from the third year after the crisis on. Now, compared to the situation uh, nowadays, we see the, the, the consequences, the reduction of production here was not so severe as in the 20s, but recovery, again, is lagging behind. Yeah, we see beginning from the second or the third year after the crisis, we are moving horizontally. We're s seeing no recovery at all, and this holds for complete Europe in, in industrial production. Yeah, and this hints us, this gives us already a hint that there is something done wrong with policy. Yeah, because policy reaction could have improved the situation, but it doesn't, or it didn't. Yeah. Unemployment. Of course, we can talk about income levels, GDP, and so on, but it's more interesting to take a look at unemployment because this is really affecting people the most. You know, if you're getting unemployed, that's a very bad situation for you, of course. You know, a lot of suffering and so on. And we see here unemployment levels, also comparison Great Depression you know, from the 30s, b before World War II, nowadays. You know, the dotted lines here, the red dotted line is Germany you know, in the 20s, the dotted line black, United States, and you see, once again, unemployment was very severe in the 1920s and 1930s, but it decreased. Yeah, it decreased after the third or four, fourth year of the beginning after the crisis, after the Great <coughs> Depression. Decreased. Nowadays, especially taking a look here at this is the dotted line here is Greece, the solid line, the gray solid line is Spain, and you see unemployment is moving further upwards. Or you might also say stabilizing at a relatively, at a very high level. Yeah, you see this here above 
Yeah, so in comparison to the Great Recession, once again, the situation looks very ugly in this case, yeah? also concerning unemployment and recovery from unemployment. It's also interesting to see Germany now. You see here the red solid line is Germany now. You're seeing unemployment decreasing even through the crisis, yeah? completely in contrast to the labor markets in Southern Europe. Okay, so from this first part, this was just a quick view on the stylized facts. We can summarize. On the one hand, we're seeing some gaining in momentum after the crisis from 2013 on in GDP growth. This is what, for instance, the International Monetary Fund is arguing. But we have to see that these are changes, yeah? rates of change. If we are considering levels, comparing levels to change, we see that recovery has not really unfolded so far. Yeah, and deviation from projected growth, even more striking, and also the comparison to the Great Recession. So we have still a long way to go to fully recover from this economic crisis. Yeah, and we also see large differences, large asymmetries between the northern, state, northern states, Germany, Austria, so on, and the southern states. Yeah, so they are very <coughs> adversely, differently affected here. Okay. So why this all? And now coming to, a, to the part where we're trying to explain this. Why is this happening? What might be the reasons for this? And where might policy have failed? So first part, called here Eurozone as the optimum currency area. So this is concerned with the policy design before the crisis. How were institutions created and was it right? Okay. So we can, we can see here, if we have a currency, a common currency, the euro is now the common currency. In former times, you had the Pesita here, the Italians had the Lira, Germans had the Deutschmark, and now we all, all have the common currency, which is the euro, of course. And now from an economic point of view, we can ask ourselves, is it good to have a common currency, or should it be, should it be better for each country to remain with its national currency? And eco in economics, we are always comparing benefits to costs to arrive at a result. Right? And also in this case, if we have a common currency, we can find some benefits of having the common currency, and we will also find costs of having a common currency. Now, benefits of having a common currency, of having the euro, you do not have to exchange your money, to change your money. Yeah? This will save us costs, because you have to pay the office and, and the, the exchange office who is actually changing your pesitas into Deutschmarks and so on, or the other way around in most cases. Uh, you can avoid this. Also, firms are not facing any more currency risks because currency prices might change and you are at risk of losing money as a firm. Uh, these are benefits of having the euro. But on the other side, on the other hand, you have the costs of the common currency. Uh, and the costs are a complete loss of flexibility here. Uh, in economic terms, you are losing a very important policy instrument here. And this policy instrument is largely affected by the central bank. Former times, each country had its own independent central bank. Now we have the ECB. Um, the central banks are affecting by their policies. Of course, they're affecting interest rates. I guess you know this. But they are also affecting the exchange rates here, yeah, the nominal exchange rates. And in economics, we know that a very important measure of international competitiveness is the so-called real exchange rate. Yeah, the real exchange rate is actually the price level that a country has. So for instance, if Spain is selling products to Germany, of course, the Germans have to pay the Spain yeah, some money. Yeah, and prices for their products are generally determined by the so-called real exchange rate, yeah, which is just made up by the nominal exchange rate times the relative price level in the country here. And now we have to consider in how far does it help to have a nominal exchange rate, to have it flexible, to have the possibility to adjust the nominal exchange rate in a crisis situation. Yeah. And for this, we pick a quick graph here. So, so economists always have like funny graphs where they are shifting curves and looking for equilibria and so on. So I will not delve too deep into this. But here we see we have a quick stylized model and you see here country A and country B. 
maybe representing Spain and Germany. Yeah, so you see the situation before the crisis, and now it's important to see that we have on the horizontal axis, we have actually output here, production levels here. Yeah. So, and before the crisis, production levels in both countries were, were more or less okay. They were good. Yeah, but then the crisis happened. Let's see what this changes to our graph here. When the crisis happened, it mainly affected, if we are picking only these two countries, it mainly affected Spain. Yeah, because Spain was hit hard by the bursting of the price bubble in the real estate sector. Yeah, we didn't have this in Germany. Yeah. Spain was affected by this bursting of the price bubble. So that, mean, that, that meant that economic performance in Spain was dropping and demand from people was dropping. Uh, you see this here, we are shifting our demand curve to the left. So what we are seeing then, on the other hand you have that Germany was completely not affected by this. Uh, Germany sound economic performance, everything is going on so far. But then you see that for Spain there are now two scenarios here. And the important thing here is to see the contraction in economic output. You see here, the contraction in economic output, once with flexible nominal exchange rates and one with fixed out flexible nominal exchange rates. And you see, if Spain had now the possibility to decrease its nominal exchange rate, so to devaluate its own currency, then we would see that the contraction in economic output would be less compared to a case where it does not have, have this flexibility. Yeah? So losing its own nominal exchange rate hinders the possibility to react to an economic crisis. Yeah? And therefore, the, the negative impact of an economic crisis is more severe, yeah? which you can see here in the drop of output in Spain. Over time, of course, then our new equilibrium, so the new intersection of both curves, has to be reached. So part point B has to be reached. But this can only be reached then if you have nominal exchange rates which are made up for, from the point of the ECB, for the whole European Union. Then you can only see a drop in the real exchange rate by a drop in the price level. Yeah? And a drop in the price level means that wages are cut in Spain, that you are increasing unemployment, that you're cutting social benefits and so on. So this is economic hardship then actually. Yeah? So reductions in the price level in a country are always harder to do and harder for the population than cuts in the exchange rate. Exchange rates can be easily affected, but price levels, that's very hard to do. Yeah? And without nominal exchange rates, the possibility to affect nominal exchange rates price levels have to decrease here in Spain with you, and this goes to reduce wages and so on. Okay, so we see as a quick summary of this, uh, of this simple model, yeah, we see that we have absence of national currency prevents us the possibility to depreciate the nominal exchange rate, but instead we have to decrease the domestic price level to gain international competitiveness, that's the main point here. You have to gain international competitiveness to get out of the crisis. Yeah? And gaining international pro uh, competitiveness yeah, goes either by increasing productivity or by decreasing prices. Increasing productivity takes really long. Uh, decreasing prices also takes long, but not so long as increasing productivity. Yeah? So we see decreasing price level necessary and decreasing price level goes hand in hand with wage reductions, shortening of social benefits, economic hardship, you know, to put it simple. Yeah. Of course, there are several factors that would alleviate these negative consequences of having a common currency. If people are very mobile across states or if you have fiscal transfers between states, then of course the negative consequences would be alleviated. But this is in most cases not the case here in Europe European Union. You know, we have very low labor mobility, we have almost no fiscal transfers between uh, the different national states here. Uh, so this is the reason why the, uh, the consequences of the economic crisis are so severe here. Yeah, so quick summary from this part, from an economic point of view, we have to argue that the euro 
is a terrible idea so far from an economic point of view because it causes a lot of unemployment, a lot of economic hardship in southern Europe. Yeah? But of course, you have always to see that economics are not the only motive, the only reason for having the common currency. Yeah? Other reasons include political motives here. Yeah? Political motives like politicians might have, um, might have introduced the euro um, intentionally to get everyone in the same boat. And you have the same fate, and then you have to deal with this fate. Yeah? This might also be considered here. Yeah? But again, there are severe economic costs then to, this, to this decision. OK, that was part two. So this was design of institutions, common currency area, before the crisis happened. Yeah? And we see that the uh, crisis was in some cases predicted by this theory here. This theor theory was made up in the 1970s, way before the crisis, and there were researchers who warned, yeah, who warned for the dangers of the crisis. Okay, then let's come to the last part here, part three, fiscal policy at the lower bound. So this is then policy reaction after the crisis. This might be a bit more, um, a bit more simple here. So you see here in the graph, the development of interest rates in the Eurozone here. Development of interest rates as it is affected by the European Central Bank. And what you're actually seeing here, beginning in 2008, we're seeing that interest rates have steadily, continually been lowered by the European Central Bank. We are actually like hitting rock bottom. You know? So we cannot go any deeper now. Zero percent is actually the lower bound for interest rates. We're even slightly below zero percent in interest rates, yeah? which, which is, which is real, really a very, um, very unusual situation, a very unusual economic situation. Yeah. So that means in economics we know that we can basically alleviate the consequence of economic crisis by two policy options. One policy option is monetary policy affecting interest rates. If you're lowering interest rates, people will invest more and therefore the economy will gain momentum. That's one policy option, monetary policy. The other policy option is fiscal policy. The government can spend more money, yeah, build buildings, bridges, streets, and so on, and this will create employment. So both options are available. Now we see monetary policy. Monetary policy has actually done everything it could. Yeah, you see, we cannot lower interest rates any further. Yeah? We cannot lower interest rates any further. We have hit the bottom here. Yeah? Now, we see some initiatives here by the ECB at the moment to further affect inflation and so on. Yeah? These are measures besides affecting interest rates, but we will see if this indeed uh, reaches the goal. Yeah? So if this indeed alleviates the, the consequences from the economic crisis. So monetary policy is largely done. So we cannot do anything more with monetary policy. Yeah? Monetary policy loses traction, we say. Now, we have, a, we have a second option. Now, this just refers to a model in economics, so I do not go uh, any deeper into the slide here. But I will come to fiscal policy, which is next up, which would be the second option here. Yeah? Fiscal policy would now be a, po a possibility for a state to um, increase the economic growth, the economic momentum here. Yeah? So we. In economics, we use, again, such a highly stylized model here, and we're seeing here that the interest rate, the lower the interest rate, actually the higher the production level, but the problem is that interest rates can now not be lowered any further. Yeah? So we, you, you see that we are hitting the horizontal axis, which is actually 0% of interest rates here. Yeah? Now we have to see what can fiscal policy do here. Normally, we would expect that fiscal policy yeah, can increase production by shifting actually this curve here, the so-called IS curve to the right, yeah, fiscal policy. But for this to happen, fiscal policy would have to be more loosely. So the state or the, the government has to spend more money here. Yeah, the government has to spend more money. This would increase economic activity. But the problem is, what are we actually seeing here? Yeah, so second policy option is fiscal policy we're actually seeing the complete opposite here. 
Yeah, the so-called Troika, made up of the International Monetary Fund, the European Commission, the European Central Bank, advises to the southern European countries, to Greece, to Italy, to Spain, to Portugal, a so-called austerity policy. An austerity policy is now a contractive fiscal policy. It means that the states should spend less money, even increase taxes, because they are highly indebted. Yeah, so the austerity policy aims to reduce public debt. Uh, public debt also rose very sharply after the crisis here. But from an economic point of view, that's terrible. Because you see, if you have an economic crisis and the state, the government, even spends less, yeah, then your economic crisis is, is intensified here. Yeah? So from basic economic theory, this is a bad idea. But what might be now the reason for the Troika to advise this policy here? Again, referring to this funny graph here. We see, if we would decrease government spending, so delta G means government spending is reduced. Yeah? You, government spends less. We are moving to the left. And you see, if we are moving to the left, production is further reduced. Income levels are further reduced. So this is classic, the, the classic prediction in the model from Keynes. Yeah? But now, on the other hand, you see here, I have depicted delta R E and delta Y E. E stands for expectations. If we are positively affecting expectations in the economy, then our curve, IS curve, might shift to the right. And then we are increasing production levels. Yeah, we're moving to the right, increasing production levels. If we are affecting expectations considering our interest rate level, that interest rates are still remaining low. And if we are affecting national income, why? Yeah, expectations, that people are expecting that the economic environment is improving. Yeah? And this should be <coughs> achieved by austerity policy. Right? So we're talking about expectations, or we also call this confidence. Yeah? The Troika is hoping, by giving this advice of austerity policy, that confidence is increased in the southern European states. Yeah? Confidence increased, which should then again, stimulate economic growth and that people should spend more um, and that enterprises invest more and so on. Yeah, so the austerity policy is actually based on the argument of increasing confidence here, of increasing confidence. So now the question is, this is all theory, right? This is all theory. Taking a look now at actual data, you're seeing here some data points. These are countries here in the Eurozone depicted, and you see here a connection between a measure of fiscal tightening. Yeah? The more we are going to the right, the more austerity. You see, you see for instance, in Greece, was the country which, which has actually done the most severe cuts in public spending. And on the vertical axis, you see the change in economic growth and economic performance in GDP. And what you're seeing here is a negative connection between both. The more fiscal tightening you are doing, the worse your economic performance. Yeah? And this confirms, basically, our classic prediction from Keynes, yeah? that the austerity policy is negative for economic growth. And we do not see at least in these data points from 2007 to 2005, we do not see these confidence effects. Uh, so confidence effects are still lagging behind. So therefore, at least for the moment, uh, at least for the moment, we have to conclude uh, that these confidence boosting effects are not visible. Right? So you're seeing here, monetary policy has done everything it could. It cannot go any, any uh, any deeper with interest rates. Uh, on the other hand, fiscal policy, uh, from this theory and also from my opinion here, completely failed. Uh, completely failed because these confidence boosting effects are not visible here. Of course, we have to see this over time. Uh, is the situation improving over time? The International Monetary Fund is arguing for the last two years we see rebounding growth, so we see an increase in confidence. 
Uh, but I would argue, if you are taking a look at absolute levels and so on, all these graphs that we uh, took, took uh, that we uh, had in part one, uh, we see that recovery is still lagging behind. Uh, so from this point of view, um, at least for the second policy option, I would argue um, completely failed, right, fiscal policy. So there have been severe policy failures after the beginning of the crisis. Yeah? And this is just a sh short summary of the presentation for today. Yeah? Severe effects of the economic crisis here and very slow recovery in the southern European states. We see that the euro as a common currency has in large parts been, from an economic point of view, a bad idea. But here, we always have to argue with political arguments also. Yeah? We cannot only see economics alone. But then if we're going to the reaction from economic policy after the crisis, here we see that this has largely failed, yeah, fiscal policy, and especially the recommendations given by the Troika. And that's my presentation for today. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, we will start with a question. Uh, please, the, I give the, the microphone here, and after the question here, we can take the other part of the question. Uh, what is the first question here? Do you have a question? Mm, the introduction of the euro in same countries has made them face more difficult situation in their economies due to the good or bad situation of the currency. Mm -hmm. For example, Greece. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't it be better for countries with worse economic status to abandon the euro and go back to the last currency? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. So in how far makes it sense now to stick to the common currency? Uh, we were talking about the design of the common currency area and so on. But now, of course, we can ask ourselves, does it still make sense for Spain or for Greece to remain in the euro? Or maybe should Spain go back to the peseta? That would be an option, right? The problem is, once you have joined the common currency area and the euro, the negative consequences of leaving the euro are very severe. Because you see that states are highly indebted. Spain has a lot of public debt. About 100% of GDP is the debt level at the moment. And you see that these debt levels, they are in euro. They are denoted in euro. Spain is indebted in euro. And if you go back to the peseta now, the peseta will devaluate compared to the euro. Now, th that's, that's actually the purpose then of going back to the peseta. Yeah? That's, that's the, uh, the graph that we picked here, right? To, um, to alleviate the consequences of the economic prices, our exchange rate would have to drop. So that means national currency should devaluate. But if the national currency devaluates and you still have to pay your debts back in euro, you even have to pay more back. Yeah? And this is, then, this is then a real problem because in the most extreme case, you cannot pay back the debt and then in future times, you know, investor confidence will be very low and nobody will lend you any money. So that's, that's a concern then for states which are now considering to go, go back to their, um, to their individual currency. So first we must pay the, the debt. Right. Okay. That would be a good solution. First paying back your debt and then <laughs> going back to the pesita. That would be an option maybe. Yeah. Okay. But it's of course, that's, that's, that I'm just making a bit of fun of this because public debt is really high and you do not see that, that states are really paying back completely the debt. And that's also not, from an economic point of view, that's, that's, that, that, that's also not very sensible to pay back your debt. Because um, if you had, for instance, if the state is, is, is building bridges, streets, buildings and so far and, and so on, then this benefits uh, generations after you and by, uh, uh, by lending money with banks and so on, um, you're giving these benefits also to future generations and you can only do this by having some debt. So it's, it's of course it makes sense for a country to have also debt, public debt. Yeah. 
public debt is not 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 that bad thing in, in itself. Uh, just a short question about the the one over there. Um, if we, in some other universe, we could pay back our debt, uh, what sense would make to go back to Peseta? Mm -hmm. the, the sense in going back to the Peseta would be that you have, again, your nominal exchange rate. You could devaluate your currency, and that would increase your competitiveness, your international competitiveness. Because if you are selling products abroad, um, then the consumers abroad have to pay a price for your product. And the price for the product is determined by the exchange rate. So, and if you can devaluate your exchange rate, you're decreasing the price for your product, and that means increase in international competitiveness. So that would be the benefit of going back to the individual currency. Okay, so, so um, paying back the debt doesn't mean really to become competitive again. That's right. Yeah, uh, paying back, back uh, the debt will not automatically increase your international competitiveness. That's right. Th that's only the real exchange rate. No? Okay. Debt is another thing. That's right. Uh, what do you think uh, was the reason uh, for the arrival of the euro crisis? Yeah. The reason for the beginning of the euro crisis, well, it was actually, um, you can summarize this by, indeed, by the real estate sector. Um, the, the crisis began in the United States. The United States also had um, a very large increase in prices for houses, for buildings, and so on, so for real estate. And then in 2007 and 2008, this price bubble just burst. So prices for houses, for, for, for real estate, were decreasing sharply. And people couldn't pay back their debt. Yeah, because you had mortgages, people had lent themselves money for paying for their house, but then the price of the house decreased and they couldn't pay back the money or they couldn't get any new money from banks. And this also affected Spain here. Not only Spain, but also Ireland. Yeah? So a lot of European countries had also problems in the real estate sector. And the large drop in prices in the real estate sector was one of the main reasons why this crisis occurred. Yeah. So it's actually a crisis in the real estate sector. A lot of people say that the crisis was um, that the crisis was affected by the high levels of public debt, but that's not true because just before the crisis, Spain had public debt levels of under thirty percent of GDP, and this cannot be then the reason that for an economic crisis or a financial crisis. Yeah. So. It's largely due to the uh, bursting of the price bubble in the real estate sector. Dear Professor Minter, in this conference, uh, you talk uh, to, to us about crisis to 1929. Even you compare in a graphic chart, uh, some countries in the past overcame the crisis, uh, int intensifying protectionism, uh, devaluing the, the currency, decreasing salaries, price coming down. So the government acts uh, for the fractionary actions. For example, in, in 1929, the United States was right uh, with these actions, but other countries not. My question is, <laughs> in the past, receipts are valid today for finish the crisis? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question, yeah. So what are actually the, the recipes for getting out of the crisis, and especially in comparison to the Great Depression then, from the 20s and 30s then? Well, one of the main one of the main lectures that also economic theory learned from the Great Depression in the 1930s was that monetary policy can help in alleviate consequences from an economic crisis. But we're seeing now in Europe, if we're taking a look at interest rates, monetary policy helped in some ways until we hit the lower bound. So from there on, monetary policy cannot help anymore. 
We could now refer to fiscal policy in helping us out here, but we see that austerity policy is advised by the Troika. I would argue that the recovery that we saw in the 1930s was mainly due to fiscal policy. Fiscal policy because, just take the situation in Europe in the mid of the 1930s, states were already preparing for World War II. And this is a large fiscal program, right? This is large fiscal spending. Uh, so fiscal spending there might have alleviated, again, the consequences of the economic crisis and lifted the economy out of this crisis in the 1930s. Nowadays, thankfully, we are not preparing for another world war. Yeah? But fiscal policy could, again, take this role. But in this case, we would maybe invest in education, in building, in streets, and so on. So that would be a possibility. Uh, well, uh, in case that Catalonia becomes an, an independent nation, uh, would you see a decrease in the development of the Spanish economy? Mm. That's, yeah, so Catalonia, yeah, that's interesting. What do you think? Would you think to see a <laughs> decrease in economic performance? Yeah, or I think what so. Do you think? Yes, I think so too. Normally, my personal opinion is, if you can be part of a union and this union works, then why should you leave this union? And I think that the union in Spain has worked for a pretty long time here, right? And, you know, maybe we have the same situation in Germany. In Germany, we have also Bavaria. And Bavaria's, there are some voices in Bavaria who are also want to leave, like Germany. They want to get separated from Germany. But I don't think that's a good idea. You know, some, some football fans in Germany, they say that's a good idea because if uh, Bayern München, Bavaria Munich is not any longer in the National Football League, <laughs> then another team will get the chance of having the championship. Yes, but I don't see any further benefits to this. If you're leaving the union and this union worked, why should you do this? And so I'm not really sure about the situation in, in Spain and in Catalonia and what's your opinion. But normally a union has some benefits and also a lot of benefits beside economic benefits. Like this was the argument, of course, by having political objectives behind forming a union. Um, normally, if you can have a union of, of strong members, then everyone benefits from this. Good afternoon. <coughs> mm, what could be the reason for that some countries of the south of Europe, um, such as Spain and Greece, uh, are considered victims of unemployment, and how has affected the appearance of the euro in the main economic sectors of these southern countries? Mm -hmm. That's right. We're seeing that the southern European countries um, are mainly affected through unemployment, right? We're seeing immensely high levels of unemployment in, in Spain and in Greece of 25%. And of course, we can argue that a lot of this unemployment is due to the crisis. But the question is how much of this unemployment is due to the crisis? Because um, I guess you also know that, for instance, the International Monetary Fund is arguing that Spain needs structural reforms structural reforms on the labor market, in the educational system, and so on. Um, for this, maybe we can take a quick look at a graph where the unemployment levels are depicted. So here you see Spain's unemployment. This is also taken from a publication of the International Monetary Fund. So you see here unemployment levels. This is the blue line. And you see here in Spain, we are now at 25% in unemployment. Before the crisis, from 2000 to 2007, somewhere at the mark of 10%, but before also high levels of unemployment. Uh, so definitely you can argue the crisis raised unemployment yeah, to very high levels. But the question is, what are the other factors that are influencing unemployment here? Uh, so most of the studies predict that Spain has a natural unemployment rate of about 15%, yeah, which is not due to 
economic crisis, yeah, to short-run effects, so to long-run effects. Yeah? So I think, I'm not really sure, but I think that some structural reforms on the labor market yeah, should be possible to reduce this long-term unemployment. Yeah? Maybe some, some reforms considering, uh, considering wages, considering education, considering the structure of the industry itself that you might have, for instance, more larger enterprises in comparison to many small enterprises and so on. Yeah? So part of the unemployment is due to the crisis, but there seems also to be large part of the unemployment which is indeed structural, yeah? which is due to long-term factors. Uh, okay. Uh, we have read in the EU Lex website that the European Union asks countries to be more productive and competitive. But uh, you can only reach competitiveness at the cost of other countries. You, re you win competitiveness when they lose it. For that reason, we think it's impossible that every country achieves competitiveness at the same time. Uh, making an analogy, uh, we are pretending the cake to be bigger when what we are actually doing is taking away other countries' pieces. Right. Uh, so here goes the, here goes the question. Uh, are the European Union appeals to be more competitive, leading us to a situation in which salaries and pensions are lower and public utilities are even worse, especially in southern countries? Uh, do you think that we might develop a common project in which every country could be more productive basing it on support, or support between countries and eliminating the competitive that assisting mm -hmm. is harming us? Excellent question. Very excellent question, yeah. That's true. In, in economics, normally we argue that economics is not a so-called zero-sum game. You know, a zero-sum game means that you have a fixed size of the cake, as you mentioned. You have a fixed size of the cake, and then it is just uh, divided between the members. But normally, at least in the long run, that's not the case. If you have economics, then you can also, for instance, increase efficiency. And an increase in efficiency means also that your cake is going to be bigger. Right? And you can divide the, this bigger cake. But in the short run, that's right. In the short run, you have also relative effects. And in Germany, a lot of people do not understand this. That's right, because um, if, you are talk if we are talking about international competitiveness, then, of course, Germany is competing also with producers in Italy, in Spain, and so on. And the loss of competitiveness in Spain and in, in Italy benefits Germany. But on the other side, Germany sells a lot of products to Spain and to Italy, so it also suffers if the economies in Spain and in Italy suffer. So it's all interconnected, and especially in the European Union. And therefore, I think that also the German policy has to take this factor into account. Yeah? And we have to give up a bit of competitiveness, so that would mean raising prices in Germany, to increase the competitiveness in the southern European states. So it's all a bit of a relative result. Yeah? That's, that's absolutely right. Mm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. As we know, Germany is the country of the European Union which has been benefited most from the euro. Therefore, the prolongation of the crisis, especially in the South European countries, in addition to because, to be because Europe has not adopted the measures necessary to solve it, acting only at the last minute to avoid bankruptcy of state or break the euro, mm, might it have been motivated by the Federal German Republic to obtain his big mm, economic benefits? Yes. Good question also, directly related to, to the question about relative competitiveness, that's right. You always have to see in the European Union, we are always having a conflict. And you can also see this conflict because we are now talking about the Brexit. Have you heard of the Brexit? You know what the Brexit is? Brexit. No? In England, you have the discussion in Great Britain at the moment that they are considering to leave the European Union. Yeah? And Great Britain has always been a very skeptical member of the European Union. Yeah? And now people are asked to vote yes or no concerning the European Union. Yeah? So there seems to be 
a lot of people in Great Britain and in England who think that national policy and national autonomy is more important or is better than being in a union again, which also relates to the question of Catalonia here. Yeah, so you always have the conflict between nationalists and between Europeans on both sides. Yeah, and of course, you also have nationalists in Germany, yeah, people who are, who are focusing on national well-being here. And of course, you have to see that politicians, they also have a certain goal. Politicians want to get elected. And the German Chancellor, Ms. Merkel, and the German Finance Minister, and so on, Wolfgang Schäuble, they get elected only by the German people. And it, as long as economic, uh, as the economic uh, situation is good in Germany, they have a high probability of getting re-elected. Yeah? So as a politician, you always have to consider both sides, the well-being of the national population and the well-being of Europe as a project here. Yeah? And of course, there are concerns here in Europe uh, in, in, in Germany, which are clearly nationalistic from an economic point of view here. Uh, hi, nice to meet you, Mr. Stefan. Nice to meet you. <laughs> uh, in the event that each European Union country had his own currency based on the GDP, uh, I would like to know the profits and the risk of the different coins devaluation during an economic crisis. Um, and if, the world, uh, if it would concern the way out of any member states. Yes. Mm -hmm. we, had a similar, uh, we had a similar question before. The question, what would happen if Spain would uh, go back to the Pisita? If Spain would go back to Pisita, we heard that there would be a lot of costs to this because you have to pay back your public debt and so on. And public debt will increase in value. And it's the same concerning your question. You have to consider both effects here. There will be a lot of costs if going back to individual currencies, a lot of costs mainly concerning the repayment of public debt. But the benefits, again, would be that you gain some flexibility in your economic policy. Yeah, flexibility, once again, in nominal exchange rates. And these flexibilities in nominal exchange rates might, of course, pay off in the long term, you know, over a very long term. So once again, you have to consider short-term short effects and long-term effects, and what would be best for you. you know? At the moment, I guess, or this is also what we are seeing, that most of the countries are still believing in the euro. You know? No country has left the euro. Greece was on the brink, but Greece is also still in the euro. So up to today, Everyone is believing in this project and that it brings benefits to each of the countries. You know? We have to see what the future brings. You know? At the moment, it's still relative. Thanks. Hi. Uh, my question is, mm, if in all European countries the same economic policies are being used, why the southern countries are the most affected and their recovery is slower? Mm. Mm. Then... Might it be because a unique economic model can be used for different countries? Yeah, that's right. You have to see the diversity, right? And we see a rather huge diversity between the individual European member states, right? You see a huge diversity not only in, in economic performance, but you also see diversity in, 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 in cultures, for instance, yeah? language. For instance, yeah, you see each of the European countries actually has its own language. So there you see large differences between the states, between the member states. And of course, you cannot advise a single policy for all the states here. Yeah, you, have to, you have to take into account national characteristics here. National characteris characteristics here in Spain concerning the competitiveness, concerning labor markets. For instance, in Greece, national characteristics concerning public debt. Yeah, so each country has, uh, has its own problems, and maybe you need your, own, your very own recipe to get out of these problems. That's right. And a single policy or a single economic model might not be suited for every single state in the European Union. That's true. Thanks. Thanks. I got some questions, not only one. Uh, first, if I've understood right, uh, you said 
austerity is not a good idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, uh, then uh, oh, I agree with you, mm -hmm. but uh, where the money comes if you don't have it to? Yeah, that's right. Maybe I I don't know. For example, uh, Spain comes out of the euro, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it has to pay the debt. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. True. True. don't pay it. Mm -hmm. Could be an option or that's right. So if you are uh, if you are applying fiscal policy to get out of the crisis, you need the money to spend because the state has to spend the money. But you need to get the money. That's right. And we're seeing. In the past, that Greece had indeed problems in getting money. But Greece is a very special situation in the European Union. Spain, at the moment, has not got any problems to get additional money. <coughs> we see this in interest rates. Interest rates is actually the price for getting money, for lending money. And normally, if you would not get any money on capital markets, you would have to increase interest rates. Right? If, if you're going as a borrower to capital markets and you want to raise money, you have to pay your lender some interest rates. Right? And if he doesn't want to give you money, you have to give him more. You have to offer him more interest rate. Yeah? But at the moment, we're seeing really low interest rates here. So it's not a problem of getting money. That's interesting to see. It's a problem of getting money for Greece. But Greece is very special in its characteristics and its history. But it's not hard for Italy and Spain to get money at the moment. This is also due to the policy, to the very, in my opinion, very good policy of the European Central Bank. Yeah, which is supplying a lot of money at the moment, and it's keeping interest rates low. And at these low levels of interest rates, it makes sense to apply fiscal policy. Um, one more. Uh, at the beginning. Ah, OK. <laughs> uh, first, uh, thank you for the conference. Uh, it has. It has been uh, too interesting. Thank you. Uh, OK, uh, some students uh, have spoken about uh, the European currency and about the peseta. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question is the same, but with a little mm -hmm. change. Uh, my question is, uh, in the hypothetical case uh, in which Spain was uh, put back into a, a dictatorial regime, mm -hmm. Uh, do you think that it could continue to introduce the euro or uh, have a chain of currency? Yeah, once again, I would like to give the question back to you. What would you think? Would Spain remain with the euro in the case of a dictatorial regime change? Uh, I think that uh, it could be difficult. It could be difficult. I think no. I think a clear no here because if Spain would go back to a dictatorial regime, it would not be any longer part of the European Union. Because the European Union is built on the principle of democracy. And if you would have a dictatorial regime once again, you would definitely not be any longer in the European Union. And of course, without the European Union, there would be no euro. So the complete European project would be abandoned then. That's the Thank that, you. that would be my prediction, at least. Yeah. <coughs> My question is, mm -hmm. if the 29th crisis was overcome in seven years, mm -hmm. why are the current crises still continue unresolved after seven years? No, that's a very good question, you see. That's a very good question because I would say, I would argue by now, because we're seeing policy failures here. Yeah? Policy failures. Policy could have done something to alleviate consequences, but it didn't. Yeah? And now we're seeing a very slow recovery, and this slow recovery is even slower than the recovery we saw in the 20s and 30s. So we might argue that policy was more effective then. So in this case, ill-advised policy recommendation for the countries most affected here. Oh. I think you are already paying a very high price you are already paying a very high price for more than five years here. Yeah, the high price is, of course, the high level of unemployment. And a high level of unemployment makes you pay a very high price, right? And it's very hard to predict at the moment when uh, you're getting out or wh when 
generally Europe is getting out of this situation. Yeah, this is maybe starting with the first slide. We see some increase in growth rates and we definitely hope that this is sustainable, that we're seeing this over the long run so that we're all getting out of this economic situation. But the price has already been paid and the price has also been paid because policy failed. Yeah, that's one part or one argument of this presentation today. Hello. Uh, uh, in the time of the crisis, we have been paying uh, a high price because of, because of it. And uh, people, normal people, have paid it. Uh, and my question is if it is viable uh, so a strong social policy on the European Union yes. nowadays. Yes, a strong social policy in the European Union. This is part of the I was talking at some point about fiscal transfers, right? On one of the slides, there were, it was mentioned to have, sorry, mentioned to have fiscal transfers here. Fiscal transfers, of course, help you to get out of a crisis, or at least to, to deal with the unemployment and so, so, so on. And it's interesting to see that in the United States, for instance, the United States also have a common currency. They have the dollar here. And they have a quite similar situation because in Florida, Florida was quite similar to Spain. There was also the price bubble in the real estate sector. And Florida experienced a very sharp economic crisis also. But then there were fiscal transfers from Washington, yeah, from the central state, to Florida. And we do not have this in the European Union, at least not in the scope. You are seeing not really fiscal transfers from the northern parts to the southern parts. We're seeing this now in the very extreme situation where, for instance, Greece cannot pay back its debt and cannot raise new debt. Yeah? But we do not see automatic fiscal transfers like unemployment benefits and so on. But if you are forming a common currency, a common currency area, you basically need this. So this would be definitely be the next step then, yeah? that we maybe have unemployment insurance and so far across Europe. Thank you. Austerity policy recommended by the Troika to overcome the crisis. To what extent is beneficial since some EU, EU, EU countries have been severely after affected have to meet the deficit targets? Is a measure to get out of this recession, recession or not? Yes, I think it is not a good measure to come out of this recession, right? Because the only argument in favor of austerity at the moment is the confidence argument, because we are seeing so low, no, uh, so low interest rates here. A different argument would be if you could not raise any money and if interest rates were really high, then you would also have an argument for austerity policy. But the only argument for austerity policy at the moment is the confidence boosting effect. And this is highly questionable at the moment. Yeah? So I don't see this effect benefiting indeed the economies in Southern Europe. So um, I was gonna ask you about the your opinion on the austerity policy because it wasn't in the slides, but you already answered it. So can I answer my question? Right, so in, in slide number 22, um, no, uh, okay, no, it's actually, it's the fiscal tightening versus the GDP. Okay. It's, it's oh, not it's that one, GDP. it's yeah, that one. Yeah, so you, uh, out of those data, that data, you um, conclude that uh, security policies was a bad policy, mm -hmm. but if we consider Greece and Spain, for example, uh, as outliers, because uh, well, the I mean the the bubble did you know explode in those countries uh, for the real estate. If we consider those as outliers, would you still conclude the same thing? Because I mean, you could say that correlation does not equal causation here. Mm -hmm. That's right. So that's that, that's not a full flexed empirical study. That's right. So we have always to be cautious in using empirical studies. That's right. And you could argue here if we're taking out single points like Greece, Ireland, or Portugal, then we would not see this downward 
this downward sloping connection. That's a good point that yeah, you're For raising. example, Japan has uh, negative five of fiscal tightening right. and still That's the right. GDP deviation went negative. That's right. That's still open to debate. So we, we shouldn't take this as, as the final answer to this question. But arguing that Portugal, Ireland, and Greece are outliers. Is and in Spain too. Well, Spain too, maybe. It's very critical because these are the countries which have been hit the most by the economic crisis and which have, been, which have seen the hardest austerity policy, the hardest, hardest fiscal tightening. And taking them as outliers, um, I'm not sure if this would not uh, give you a, 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 a distorted picture then. Yeah. So, so the southern countries um, drag down the European Union mm -hmm. uh, when we're talking about austerity policies, mm -hmm. right? That's right, but, but austerity policy was mainly prescribed to the crisis countries, to oh. the southern European countries. But you're raising a very good point here, that's, that's true. And this is still left to be done now for economic research. Now this will continue, the debate about the benefits and costs of austerity policy, and it's not yet answered, you're right. You're right. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, at the beginning, you said uh, you put a picture about uh, the old man and the young guy. Yes. Talking about... The cartoon, right. Yeah. And it could be uh, because of that, uh, the economic uh, crisis. I mean, we are we're not living in an utopic uh, situation. Mm -hmm. For example, I, I, we don't know as well as you, I think, in Germany, the situation with Syria mm -hmm. or things like that couldn't be that we are uh, to maintain that peace. Mm -hmm. We are paying an economic cost. Yes, we're doing it, right. Yes. Yeah, we're paying an economic cost, that's right, for the peace. Um, but now you can ask, is it worth this economic cost? That's right. Um, I would argue yes, because <coughs> if you're seeing 60 years of peace, um, that's, that, that's worth so, some form of economic cost. But we, we also have to consider that this economic cost doesn't have to be so large as it is at the moment. Yeah, because policy would have some options here to reduce the costs. And that should be the purpose of, of any policy, to reduce economic hardship here. On the other hand, you're also right, the, econ the, the Euro European project is based on solidarity, on solidarity. And people have to feel as Europeans. And if that is increasing further in the future, then we will also see that economic consequences from crisis will be reduced because people would be willing to give fiscal transfers yeah, to, to states which are negatively affected. This is also based on solidarity here. Yeah, solidarity and a positive opinion towards the European project. That's important. There are more questions? If not, uh, yes, one more. Um, this is difficult to say, okay, because mm -hmm, sure. I'm not, uh, I'm a bit of skeptic about capitalism, so it's uh, difficult to make this question, but the thing is that um, after I don't know, I don't have def de deep knowledge about economics, mm -hmm. but I like to, you know, read a bit and things. So mm, I see this this thing as a lot of uh, there are so many factors that uh, mm, politicians mainly try to tell us and, and convince us, making the, their own point of view. So in the end, uh, I think people believe in lies because different points of view of the real tr truth mm -hmm. are lies. So um, I have mm, things, mm, thoughts like if a, if a country needs debt to needs to to mm, to become uh, to have a greater debt to pay his own debt, mm -hmm. uh, what this. Uh, leads us to because mm -hmm. uh, you know that doesn't come it comes with interest rates mm -hmm. so if if we really have to pay our interest rate to to pay 
uh, the depth that we have to, you know, it's a, it's a cycle. So that's very confusing, and with that, a lot of a lot of things. So in the end, uh, I feel that the the project of European Union failed uh, because we're not really thinking as each other as as life partners, but as temporal partners, maybe with. Uh, not trusting fully in the, the others. We're, we're not really a country, and, and I think we're treat, treating the, the European Union as a country. Um, and, and I really end up like mm, watching the European Union and, and thinking this is a struggle to, to maintain the, the system going, 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 uh, without any regards on, on, the, on the consequences of, of people. <coughs> so, uh, it's funny to hear people like you uh, with deep knowledge about economics, it's obvious, and, and saying things like the politics have, the policies have failed, but then uh, the, the ones holding power don't hear you, uh, or people who, you know, I, I, I'm, as, as far as I'm concerned, there are two, two streams of economic. So, uh, so, so, so. Economists it's that right, right. Uh, one that say that austerity uh, till we die, and the others who say True. like you. True. So what do you think about this? this is it really a? a is there some truth in this mm -hmm. all theater? Yeah, very good question. That's a general question uh, uh, with respect to science, right? Because normally in science and especially in the social sciences, we do not have a clear-cut answer. We do not have a clear-cut answer. Maybe you know the, the, the novel by Douglas, uh, how is it called, Douglas Adams, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe or something. And there's one big question, and at the end, the single answer to the question is 42. So 42 is the answer to all questions. <laughs> but of course, in social sciences, we do not have this. We do not have a single answer, and you are perfectly right. There are economists who are arguing with me, have the same opinion as I have, and there are economists who have exactly the opposite opinion. And these economists are also in the majority in Germany at the moment. Now, you have to say to this that normally economists do not argue about, for instance, the models they are using or the theory that they're using, but they are arguing about the effects that are occurring. And arguing about the effects is directly the, 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 the question that we had before. You can argue about the data and what you are seeing here in the data. Yeah, I'm arguing you see a clear, clear negative correlation here. You see a clear negative relation between austerity and growth. But you are perfectly right. If you're arguing that you have some outliers which should not be included, then you get a different picture. Yeah, so that's a problem in social sciences compared to natural sciences. In natural sciences, you get more clear-cut answers. In social sciences, that's not possible. Right? So you always have arguments here. People arguing, especially politicians arguing. We can, from, from, economics, from, from economics, we can advise politicians, but we can also be never be sure if politicians are really taking up the advice. Politicians always have also a self-interest, once again. You know, they, they want to get re-elected. That's natural for a politician. Um, concerning your other questions, right, solidarity, once again, really important. The complete European project is based on solidarity. Yeah? The more solidarity we have, the more common we feel, the better will the project of the European function uh, in the future. The last, uh, the, your, or your first question, concerning capitalism, that's also a very good question, right? Capitalism is based on the principle of debt and the principle of interest rate. Yes, but we do not have any alternative. So that's not the best system we have, that's right. But what are the alternatives here? Right. So we can, <laughs> but that would, uh, that would be worth another complete presentation here. Yeah? The benefits and costs of capitalism, that would be nice maybe for next time. So. <laughs> um, I want to, to ask something I wanted yeah. to, to ask, but about uh, the, uh, this question, I think it's very interesting. And um, could the basic in, uh, income uh, a tool to go out for crisis like this? Do, do you know the, the basic uh, income or um, uh, income in German? Uh, 
Ah, the basic income in German. You mean average income? Mm -hmm. the basic income, from, 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 from uh, money for all uh, people um, without work. Without work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have about the basic uh, income for the, in Germany, for, that's sorry. right. For the old people is renta basica. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you have about, I know that if you are getting unemployed, it's, it's, a, it's a bit more complicated because it depends on the duration of your unemployment, right? The, the, the unemployment benefits in the first and second year depend on your last, uh, on your last wages that you received over the years. And if you are longer than two years unemployed, you are getting uh, paid your rent and additionally about 400 or 500 euros on top. So it's, if you sum it up, it's about 800 or 900 euros maybe that you're getting from social benefits. It's different if you are uh, retired then because retirement benefits are based on your lifetime income. Yeah? But, but yeah, basic income would be about 800, 900 euros in Germany. Um, th there are countries now in Switzerland, for example, uh, was thinking about uh, to, to put this uh, basic income. Um, and uh, there are uh, some economists that think that in the future, not uh, um, not uh, all people can could be work, and is the the tool to to give money for the people to 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 buy products that the company do. Mm. We're talking about technological change then, right? Mm -hmm. How far is technological change uh, changing our work environment? So maybe we do not need so many people working in the future that machines and robots and so on can work for us. And then we have to distribute income, of course, because in this case, if you have fewer people working and so on, you are getting distributional effects because those people who own the, the, the capital and so on, so we're again in, in the realm of capitalism here, uh, those people who own the, 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 the buildings, the machines, and, and, and so on, they will uh, reap the main benefits from this. And of course, we have to do distribution and redistribution. And one, uh, one measure, to one, one method to, to redistribute income would be through the basic income. Okay. Uh, Dr. Stefan, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Okay. And uh, we hope that we can see you next year, too. It was a pleasure and for me, too. We are always you invited here. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you for your question. <laughs>